Great. Uh, we'll be uh, beginning the webinar in one minute. Marilyn, it's time to go ahead and share your screen. Yes, we're live, Susan. Yes, thank you. Marilyn, if you can share the screen to begin the webinar. Okay, All right, wonderful. I think we'll go ahead and start. Um, so welcome everyone to the Planet Gold webinar event on artisanal and small scale gold production, technology without mercury. And we're happy uh, to welcome participants from all over the globe today. Um, be before we begin, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Rocio Fernandez from UNIDO to share some housekeeping items about today's webinar. So Rocio? please. Thank you, Susan. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. We would like to remind you that the simultaneous interpretation function is now available at the bottom of your screen. If you cannot see it, please download the Zoom application. Thank you. Bonjour et bonsoir. Nous souhaitons vous rappeler que la traduction en français est disponible sur le panneau de configuration en bas de votre écran. S'il n'apparaît pas, veuillez télécharger et installer l'application Zoom. Merci. Buenos días y buenas tardes. Nos gustaría recordarles que la funcionalidad de interpretación simultánea está disponible en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Si no la ven, por favor, descargan la aplicación de Zoom. We would also like to remind you to please kindly put your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom. You can also see the Q&A uh, item at the bottom of your screen. So please just direct your questions there, which is uh, where we will be looking at for, for the discussion se uh, session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rocio. Okay, Marilyn, next slide, please. Um, I just want to make a few more points before we dive in. Um, the aim of this webinar is to allow for an overview of a wide range of technologies that can be used to produce gold from artisanal and small scale gold mining or ASGM. We will be using that acronym a lot today. Um, as well as some real world experiences with these technologies. So given our very short time and we have many presenters, um, we're, we're really only going to be able to give you a first introduction to these technologies. And I'm sure there will be lots of questions. So we have allotted some time for discussion after each series of presentations. And as Rocio just mentioned, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions, because that's the function that our team will be monitoring, not the chat box. I mean, you're welcome to put uh, anything in the chat, but for questions, we'll be monitoring the Q&A box. However, there are likely to be more questions than we can answer during this webinar. So I want to mention that we've created a comment function on the event page on planetgold.org, where you can submit your questions and comments after the event. And we'll do our best to answer them and to keep the dialogue going even after the event. And so I'm going to ask one of the team to put the link to the event page in the chat now uh, so that you'll be able to see. And there'll be a, there's a comment box there. Um, we are also recording this session and it will also be made available through the event page. And finally, I'm obligated to point out that this webinar is meant for information exchange purposes and the participation of commercial entities in this event does not represent their endorsement by the Global Environment Facility, by the United Nations Environment Program or by the event organizers. So now with those logistics out of the way, um, I am pleased to have our introduce our first uh, discussant. Um, so, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Telmer, who is the Executive Director of the Artisanal Gold Council. Um, I am sure that many of you know Kevin as a well-known expert on ASGM, and he's been working for many years, I won't say how many, uh, to improve economic, social, and environmental aspects of the sector, including reducing mercury use. And Kevin is going to kick off our webinar with some general reflections on issues to consider when promoting mercury-free technology. So Kevin, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Susan. <clears throat> Great to be here this morning. I'm, uh, I'm actually in Medellin, Colombia. It's about 8 a.m. in the morning here. 
um, I, I think it's a great uh, uh, initiative that you've put together and it should be an exciting day full of, um, you know, interesting discussions and presentations. <clears throat> But I'm, uh, I have the privilege of kind of setting the scene a little bit here. So, you know, eliminating- uh, I, I'm sorry, Kevin, excuse me. I think we do have a slide for you. Um, Marilyn, okay. if you can advance the slide. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so let me just say a few words and then the slide really summarizes my, my input here. Um, the, the quest to go mercury free has been going on for for many years hence susan's comments about my uh, my long uh, sort of efforts on this on this matter but uh you know it's been going on for many years <clears throat> trying to get rid of mercury so why hasn't it happened already is something that everyone that's on this call really should should consider you know everyone that's promoting alternatives really should think hard about why hasn't it happened because that's partly uh, you know, the secret or a, an important consideration um, to, to make some of these alternatives actually work and scale up and have an impact. So the general idea behind mercury free technology for artisanal miners um, is that miners can get more gold with zero mercury and that that additional gold will pay for any additional expenses, uh, including any extra time required um, and the outcome would still be more profitable. So there's a profit or an, uh, you know, a financial uh, incentive system at the root of, um, of having a mercury-free technology uh, be attractive to miners and to scale up. There's other things as well, you know, doing the right thing, uh, eliminating environmental pollution, um, you know, reducing sort of health risks. But the, the primary incentive um, is an economic one. So this idea is generally sound, um, you know, more, more gold, less mercury. So why is it still so stubborn a problem? Because it's a stubborn problem. We've been having this conversation for, you know, I could go, I could say 20 years, but let's just say 10 years. In the last 10 years, people have really, it's become more of a mainstream issue and yet it's still a big problem. <clears throat> So one of the things that's a, uh, a driver is the context of each mining community. And it would be great if everyone presenting on this, uh, on this, this session, this, uh, this uh, webinar, um, think about the context of where they're trying to replace mercury. So that's a fundamental consideration. What is your target context? Are you trying to help miners that take a shovel and go off in the hills and they work in a very rudimentary fashion? Um, or are you trying to help groups and miners that are working in a more centralized approach that may have sort of more capacity to, uh, you know, to onboard a centralized approach? So that's quite an important consideration. So you might mention to the audience, what is your target context as we go through these, uh, these, these presentations? And then there, are, there's maybe three other things I wanted to mention. <clears throat> I'll call two of them are kind of barriers. And the third one, um, it's, it's recognized in, in theory, but less so in, in practice, it's kind of a concept. So the, the first one, so I've mentioned the context, uh, the next thing is, is recovery. Um, getting higher recovery with sort of simple mercury-free alternative technology is not always easy to demonstrate. In fact, it can be truly difficult to prove to miners. So, uh, how do you go about uh, proving that your alternative has a higher recovery? I mean, it's, you know, in the lab, it's easy to say it might be easy. It might actually be quite difficult even for ourselves to prove that we're getting um, higher recovery. <clears throat> um, but it's, ex it's very important to be able to do that to, uh, uh, for the artisanal miners. And just to give those who are not an incredibly technically oriented uh, a bit of a guidance on this, um, one of the big challenges is that each batch of ore that gets processed is different. So I take some ore and I process it and I get one or I get some gold and I take the next batch and the next batch might have less gold in it. And so this is a big challenge, you know, how much gold is being produced, even the concept of recovery in percentage is a difficult concept for people to really, uh, in, you know, understand and to embrace and to prove to different mining groups and people. There's, of course, a big financial barrier to going uh, mercury-free, 
And I wanted to mention here that the financial barrier is not necessarily a large number. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. It has to be thought of in terms of, you know, how long does it take miners to pay back an investment into mercury free processing? So one, not a nice way to look at this is to, you know, how many days of work would it require a miner or a group of miners to repay the investment that they need to make uh, in order to, you know, purchase and begin to operate this, uh, uh, this mercury free technology. So expressing the investment needed by miners in the days of mining needed is a nice way to do that. Again, if you have the opportunity to do that in your presentations, I think that would be great. And then, and also what's the practical limit in terms of the days of mining? You know, beyond which the miners would not, uh, they would not pursue this, they wouldn't go for it. Um, you know, you could also express this in terms of uh, grams of gold, they need to uh, invest or reinvest in their mercury free technology. That's important because we often don't think about artisanal miners uh, with the right time scale, like one week or two weeks of extra effort might seem small to us, but it might be huge to artisanal miners. So that's uh, helpful to express this, this financial, um, this financial you know, in, uh, need, this financial uh, effort that miners need to make in a, in a time frame and in sort of units that they can understand and that other people can understand so that uh, this can be upscaled again. And the last one that I think is really key and important is about whether you're really talking about a, a mercury replacement or a mercury alternative. So I would say uh, roughly to date, there has been no direct replacement for mercury, meaning that there is no alternative technology that's super cheap, extremely portable and very fast that is like mercury, where you, know, you just add mercury to a concentrate that you've created at day's end and 15 minutes later, you know what your day's efforts have produced. So if you can, uh, again, you know, inform the audience that is your technology a direct replacement? Probably not um, for mercury, or is it an alternative technology that has an alternative process? And it, very importantly here, does your technology produce a concentrate that requires still another step to get the gold out of that concentrate? And if that's the case, how do you recommend that miners do that? And I wanna just dwell here, it's my last point uh, briefly to say, okay, you know, you've got a high recovery gravimetric system. So it's getting at least your, uh, your theory, um, maybe even what you've been able to show is that you're getting more gold, but it's still in a concentrate. So a miner or a group of miners is left with a kilogram or 10 kilograms of concentrate at the end of the day. How do they get that gold out of the concentrate? And a key thing here to think about is, is that, uh, is there a risk that mercury would still be used on those concentrates that your technology generates? Is there a risk that mercury would still be used to get on that final step to get the gold out of those concentrates? And if there is that risk, how do you, you know, how do you uh, try to manage that? How do you disincentivize this from happening um, you know, with, uh, with your alternative mercury technology? So uh, that's, That'll be it for my introduction. I hope that helps everybody. That's kind of a scene setter. And I really uh, look forward to hearing from, from all the participants. Thanks so much. Great, that's really that's really great, Kevin. Thank you. That's really uh, excellent uh, group of issues to start thinking about as we gear up to hear our presenters. Um, but before we start our first technical session, we wanted to just take a moment to share some perspectives from miners who work with the Planet Gold program, because obviously miners are the ones who are the most affected by the transition away from mercury. Um, unfortunately, due to technical limitations, we couldn't have all the miners with us live today, um, but they sent us some comments via pictures and videos. Um, so we can share those with you. Um, and so um, in the first uh, case, we have a, a miner from our planet, uh, one of our um, beneficiaries from our Planet Gold Guyana project. Um, and she has shared a quote with us that says, 
Um, ever since we've been mining, we've used the gold cube. I think we were the first ones to introduce it in this area. And shortly after, some other miners began using it since it's very effective in terms of gold recovery. We basically use it as a secondary processor. If they could make the gold cube bigger, that would be good. I believe that the switch to the use of mercury-free technologies is possible through demonstration activities. And next slide, please. Um, here we have a Bernard Alfonso who says the new technology is very good because we don't have to use mercury. That's one of the main things we want to eliminate, the use of mercury. With the new technology, we can process faster. It separates the ore from the black sand. It increases gold recovery and it captures the fine gold that the normal old style doesn't capture. So you'll be hearing more about uh, the technologies they're referring to in the upcoming session uh, Deshaun will share with us. Um, but now let's move to some miners from Mongolia and Burkina Faso, and they can speak for themselves. So Marilyn, if you could please uh, start the next video. Замбат цаан уу намаг мөгцөө гэдэг би ховдаймгийн алтаас сумын майхан нэртэй алтны үндсэн ордны үндсэн ордны бичлүүрхэн талбайд 240 жилдээ ажиллаж байна. Ховдаймгийн хэмжээнд 600 км одоо иргэн тойронд бол өдөр байжуулах зэх байдаггүй. Өдрөөс алтыг бол усруулахтаа гар аргаар нуу тохиолж авдаг нь одоо эдийн засгийн үүрш юм багтаа байгаа. Planet Gold төсөл маань манай бүс нутагт хэрэгжсэнээрээ алтыг өдрөөс одоо ялгаж авах та мөнгөө өсгөө байгаль дэлхийд ээтэй ээлтэй тийм бидний ажлыг хөнгөвчлсэн эдийн засгийн үр өгөөж ихтэй ийм төсөл болно гэдэг бид нар итгэлтэй байдаг. Go ahead, and now let's hear from Burkina Faso. Great. Fantastic. So really happy to hear the miners are very enthusiastic and uh, really have a um, hope for the mercury free technologies. So now we're going to open the event, uh, open the first technical session, and uh, we're going to hear um, first from Orango Uma, technical assistant at Nancio, a small scale mining company with operations in Kenya and Tanzania. And he's provided us with a video for us to watch first, but he's also here with us live later to answer questions. I do want to point out that I'm in the interest of time, I'm only going to give very brief introductions to the presenters, but you can find their full bios and photos on the very handy event webpage. Um, so please, uh, Marilyn, go ahead and start our first presentation um, from Orango Uma. Welcome to our presentation. 
My name is Orongo Ouma. Last year, Autospayers is a gold mining company that has been existing for the last 21 years. We operate in two countries that neighbor each other, which is Kenya and Tanzania. In Kenya, we have three different uh, mining sites, while in Tanzania, we have only one. For a long time, we have been processing our gold using mercury until 2018, when we realized the hazardous effects of mercury on its, our employees and the environment we work in. So uh, since that, uh, the company concerns much on the well-being of its employees and the community it works, we made an investigating team uh, that, to do a research on this. The research team, after tireless work, they came up with the Mitambo technology. We had to migrate from the use of mercury to the new method. We created awareness to the public on the effects of mercury. The company used its few resources to freely train the public. So, real ladies and gentlemen, this is how our Mitambo technology works. Uh, we, uh, this is uh, a fine powder that has been ground. It has been brought from uh, the machine, that is the crushing machine, after it has been dried from uh, the extraction site. So number two, the method two, we pour the, the already fine uh, grains on a civilized structure. This is now the metabo. So we pour water, we pour water slowly to ensure that uh, the gold is attracted in this rough carpet. This is a rough carpet or a coffee bag or any cotton cloth. So uh, the water will be poured slowly, it will run slowly into the waste deposit. Now the gold will remain here. Sand will be moved by water. They will come, they will be washed by water to this side. Number three, we wash the, the cloth, that, this sack, this carpet, we wash it with water in a leather container with water. After that, we start uh, rotating or shaking this container to ensure that uh, our gold rests or sinks in the bottom of this container. We slowly pour that water, this water and add, this water will come out with sand, leaving a residue that is a mixture of uh, our gold and other mixtures. So uh, our, in uh, method five, we take our residue, we dry it using electricity or fire. Well, we can also use sun, uh, sun, but uh, you know, sun may uh, heat it uh, maybe slowly, slowly. So we we'll use fire or electricity or any heater. After that, the uh, mixture is then separated using magnet. This is the magnet. Magnet will attract the iron filings or any magnetic material, leaving our pure gold here. In case there are any other impurities, like maybe there were some particles of sun will blow using our mouth or maybe if uh, not the mouth we'll use any blower to blow the sun so because gold is heavier than those particles gold will remain resting here then those particles will be blown out this is now the extraction site this is the granite hardcore this is the ore that we get this gold from this is now the uh, rocks that have been uh, broken down for uh, grinding. This now we are airing. We are airing them to the sun to dry. So as we take them to the uh, grinding machine for us to realize fine powders. This is the crusher, the crushing machine. This is now the fine powder that has already been crushed. This is now a uh, washing process. This is how we do wash in Mitambo technology method. This water is poured slowly to ensure that maximum gold are uh, stopped or are uh, trapped by the rough carpet. As you can see, this man is uh, pouring this water slowly. The water moves through the, uh, the, the, the this long board to the waste deposit hole. As you can see, this is now the washing, the washing process. We are now washing the carpet, the, that rough carpet. As you can see, we have to shake it repeatedly so as uh, uh, the particles, the gold particles to drop inside this larger basin.
This should be done with a lot of care to avoid wastage. This is now uh, the shaking process. After we wash, we now shake. We now shake using this one like this. Then uh, we do this slowly, slowly to ensure that gold sinks in the bottom of this basin so as not to uh, waste even a single gold particle. Sand mixed with water will come out, leaving gold in bottom of this basin, as you are seeing. You can now see. Then we are going to decant that water and remain with the residue. Dear ladies and gentlemen, this method works with any type of ore, so long as it is ground to fine powders. This method needs hands-on training method because we usually involve our, our people, the society, in experiments. This method is the best method to use because it favors everybody in the society from lower, middle, and upper classes and therefore can be afforded by even common men and women in our society. This is because it is less costly and can also be done communally. We also have uh, uh, the successes of this method where we have already uh, trained more than 15% who have already embraced uh, our technology. 15% of the, uh, the community we do work in. Another one we have also managed to reduce uh, mercury health related problems by 15% because some have been have migrated from that old mercury method to this new method that is free of mercury. Now after decanting, we now get, uh, the this is the residue, as you can see here. It is wet because uh, the, the residue had some water, so we have to dry it before we use magnetic uh, force or magnet to, uh, to separate it. This is how we can uh, dry it. We can use fire, electricity, or any heater that can be used to dry it. Now, this is a magnet that is being passed to attract ion fillings and some non-magnetic materials that will be left will be blown, either using a blower or uh, by just blowing to using mouth forces. This is now our gold that is ready for market. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that wonderful video uh, showing your mercury-free solution. And as I mentioned, now, the Nuncio team in Orongo is live with us today, and we can ask them some questions um, later during the Q&A session. So next up is Deshaun Billingley. He's the technical specialist for the Planet Gold Guyana project. And Deshaun is going to explain how the team there designed a gravity circuit for use at Planet Gold demonstration sites in Guyana. So go ahead, Deshaun. Hi, good morning. Good evening to everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Deshaun, and I will be just giving an overview of what has been done here in Guyana at our project sites. Next slide. Okay, so the two basic ore types that we have here in Guyana are alluvial and hard rock. Um, we have demonstration sites set up in both region seven and region eight of Guyana, region seven being the Peroni area and region eight being the Madia area. Um, so the sites are 
areas for mining in these regions, persons generally use for small scale and medium scale, they normally use sluice boxes and a mechanical dredge. Next slide, please. So this is the setup in the Peroni area. This is the laterite that we encountered before selecting where we would construct our circuit. Next slide. Um, these are the technologies that we introduce to the area. Um, we have the crusher, trammel, gold catcher, shame table, gold cube, and blue ball. Next slide. These are just images of the technology so that persons, you know, may be aware of, of these. Uh, next slide. This is a layout of our circuit. So we have the, the ore going to the sluice box and the discharge from the sluice box is placed into a sump or a pit. And that is then feed to our trommel. The oversized material is then sent to the crusher and then returns back to the trommel, which would then feed to our gold catcher. And the concentrate from the gold catcher and the gold master is then feed to the shaking table. Next slide. This is just the uh, testing phase of our setup. Um, before we started the production aspect, we ran water through the sluice box and then we had to see if it would be able to take the actual slurry. So we ran slurry uh, with ore that we, we identified for testing. Next slide. Um, this is a video of the operation. You can click play. You need it more than you need a life jacket. Okay, so that video was when we just started the equipment to ensure that everything was running. Um, we, the setup was actually a bit uh, fun. Uh, when we started the, the first run of the samples through the equipment, um, persons were, persons in the, in the neighboring campsites uh, were very much interested to see what we were doing. So we invited them over. Um, I'm not sure we have any pics of that, but we invited them over and they, they showed their enthusiasm for the technology that would be in the area. Next slide. All right, so these are just a few recovery rates um, that, was, that were tested in in the the, the town. Um, so we may not have the the you know cutting edge technology, but the ones that we have, we try to improve the tech the, the recovery rate so that you know miners would be more attracted to the technology. Um, next slide. This is just an average cost of what the circuit setup would be. Um, most miners uh, tearing from small scale, high end small scale, would be able to procure this, this list of equipment. Um, but we still cater for those that may not be on that end of the spectrum like the artisanal, we, we 
met with a few of them and they were interested, they were more interested in the blue bowl and the Go Conquer or Go Cube. So we did some demonstrations with them, even let them bring their own ore so that they can, you know, participate in the demonstration. Next slide. Uh, thank you. That's it for me. I'm sorry, I had muted myself. <laughs> that wasn't smart. Thanks, Deshaun. I uh, really appreciate uh, that good presentation, and we'll get in, you know, to a few more questions that are coming through um, during the during the panel discussion. Um, so next up, we have uh, Winifreda Kanwa who is a mineral processing engineer with Solidaridad in Tanzania. And Gwenefrida will speak about Solidaridad's efforts to promote mercury-free mining in Tanzania, also uh, using gravity separation approaches. So go ahead, Gwenefrida. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone. Um, I work with Solidaridad in Tanzania and uh, together with Impact Facility and Solidaridad, we implement projects in East Africa, means Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. And we work with artisanal and small-scale gold miners. We train them to produce responsibly, sustainably, but also to formalize. Next. So um, uh, the autonomous miners, as you see in the picture, this is the real environment where they work. When they do amalgamation with mercury, with that, that pond, uh, water containing mercury is contained. Uh, it is not released into the environment. Next. We train miners to adapt mercury-free technologies where we have worked with gold culture together with the shaking table to concentrate gold. And then uh, the preceding process is the direct smelting. So with gold culture, it uses centrifuge force to concentrate gold as it rotates. Since gold is heavy, it sticks in the ball inside that, uh, that uh, picture what you see. And then the light minerals evaporate. So we have worked with it. We have done some experiment to see its efficiency, but also uh, to see how, if we can recommend this to miners. But with the, exper uh, the experiment we did, we encountered some challenges because the material, um, because the material which we feed here is the powder, which has been produced from underground uh, mining. Uh, whereby the size reduction process takes place and then it is taken to the bombing where they are ground. Then you get the powder and it is fed, the, the powder is fed manually to the gold culture and water has been added in order to have slag which flows into it. So uh, the challenge here is how to control the slurry density, which is 30 to 50% because they are just adding water manually. So as it rotates, then they estimate time, like uh, 30 minutes, 40, whereby they switch it down or uh, off, whereby uh, the bowl is removed and it is rinsed to have the concentrate. And this concentrate is taken to the shaking table for more concentration, whereby um, uh, from maybe 100 uh, kilograms of the powder, then we can have a half a kilo of the concentrate. Next. Yeah, those are the pictures of the gold catcher and sh shaking table. Next. And so uh, the concentrate which has been obtained from the uh, shaking table then is treated with direct smelting, whereby we use the furnace 
to, to treat this concentrate. And we add borax and stretious flux in order to reduce the melting point of the, uh, the minerals, but also um, this uh, concentrates to about length. I mean, it smelts and to have the grade of, of, of gold of about 98% and it treats high grade ore. And the source of heat should be gas and mainly oxygen gas, which can have uh, the temperature of around 1,200. But can we use the furnace, but also one can use the crucible and treat uh, the concentrate with direct fire, gas fire, whereby um, this is uh, uh, also the source of, of heat is oxygen. Next. So uh, with that smelting, uh, the challenge is that uh, it takes time, but also the, the silicious material uh, or the fraction is not is complex for the miners to use since they have to estimate themselves. If it could have been produced maybe from the industry already mixed, that a miner is all, only told to to maybe measure about a, a half a kilo and add in the concentrate and then heat, it could be easy. But uh, they are struggling on using it. Then, uh, solid that together with impact facility, we conducted some experiments with borax to see how it can operate efficiently so that we recommend with, uh, to the miners. Uh, then uh, the pictures you see there is that we measured the borax and uh, conducted some experiments where it was a half a kilo. Uh, after measuring, then we added the, the concentrate and the borax, and then we treated it to the direct gas uh, fire. And then we got something like uh, charcoal. We couldn't differentiate gold and other minerals. You couldn't see anything, just black. And then this one was dipped into concentrated nitric acid, as where you see those fumes, where other minerals dissolved, but also we remained with gold, which was, was still having some impurities. And this one, we added the water in order to dilute the acid, but also cool down and allow uh, the concentrate to settle. After settling, and then we we, we filtered the heat and then went back to, to treat with gas fire. Then the borax was also added. Next. So from there, we got some gold, uh, but uh, the, comp the process was really complex for the miners and it needs high grade ore. So as a result, we see that uh, uh, it can work for miners with high grade ore, but for those with low, low grade ore, it is not economical. Then from there, we communicate with miners, we train them on these technologies, but also as we did those experiments, we engage them for them to understand the real process and see how it can work for them. So uh, miners are ready to adapt to these technologies uh, if and only if the technology is cheap, for them, but also it proved efficient and high recovery. And then if it is time consuming and easy to operate, but also they need training on these technologies for them to operate and uh, adapt to them. Thank you. Thank you, Winifreda. Thanks for that uh, really interesting presentation and really, uh, um, deep experience with trying to uh, promote these technologies to the miners and their different questions. Um, our final uh, presenter for this session is Stephen Yaboa, who's the CEO of Commodity Monitor Limited, um, which is an equipment supplier that's now working to disseminate mercury-free equipment among ASGM miners in Ghana. So Stephen, please go ahead with your presentation. All right, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, good morning, colleagues, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, uh, my name is Steven, and I work with Commodity Monitor. We, we are based here in Accra, and basically we are working on um, providing uh, mercury-free solutions for small-scale miners in Ghana. Next slide, please.
Uh, so basically, uh, Ghana is Africa's largest gold producer, and small scale miners contribute about 40% of gold produced here. And it happens that mercury is a critical component of the process that they uh, are able to uh, they, are, they, they are able to uh, recover gold. Um, we as a company, we are a logistics trading and research company. So we uh, sought the process and a solution for them is basically that when they start crashing to uh, cementing, they, that process has to be interconnected. Where there is a disconnect is where I think outcome of gold um, uh, recovery is affected. So we our technology basically is for hard rock uh, gold deposits in Ghana here, alluvia gold deposits and alluvia. And basically from the test we've done from various regions in Ghana, from the northern part of uh, Ghana to the eastern part to the southern part, we've seen that um, the recoverable gravity recoverable rate has been ninety percent plus. So it's been you know a direct engagement with these miners and it shows that evidence that this alternative to mercury is a highly effective and then it's more of like a double of their recovery that they get when they use mercury next slide please so the first process we we look at is basically that uh um, um, this presentation is looking is focusing on rock, but basically we are also into alluvia. So the first process is the, the, the use of the jaw crusher. So the jaw crusher helps in, it facilitates their work in in breaking down bulky um, um, ores into into three millimeters. So basically, what we provide is both an electric and an engine driven jaw crusher, which helps in the in the entire process. And the capacity ranges from two to three tons per hour. And this is, I think, the best suit for a small scale artisanal, uh, small scale gold miner here in Ghana. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, this picture show uh, our field present uh, field engagement that we have with the miners where uh, these rock um, uh, were crashed very simply uh, for them to operate. Can we go to the next slide? So from the jaw crusher, where um, the ores are broken down into three millimeters, it comes to the impact, you know grinder. So this impact grinder, uh, which is a product we are currently using from, uh, from APT, uh, we, we, we are deploying this to, make, uh, to these miners. And apparently, we have about five or more of these machines you know, in the hands of uh, small scale miners here in Ghana. And it's working perfectly for them. And depending on the nature of the oil, Ghana has most of its oil being oxides and also sulfides. So depending on the nature of the oil uh, and the kind of liberation needed to get optimum gold, we change the screen, we adjust the screen sizes. And then the screen size ranges from 0 0.8 millimeters to 1.5 millimeters. So we adjust it based on the nature of your ore, and then how you can get the optimum recovery rate. So this machine has a, a rate of about 1.5 to 3 tons per hour. And we can, it, 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 of course, it demands some water, which is uh, 2 to 3 meter, meter cube per, per hour. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so this is basically the, the rock machine in this uh, in the field operation. Next slide, please. So the from the uh, the far impact find uh, impact grinder, it comes to the go catcher, which uh, some colleagues have also uh, demonstrated. So the go catcher is attached to this machine because basically it helps in you know I would say. Uh, making simple the work of the small scale miner. What will take the small scale miner about five hours in terms of having to wash the gold or recover the gold from its concentrate? It takes you know less than 30 minutes for the gold catcher to accomplish that purpose. And with our engagement so far in the field, recovery you know uh, based on you know uh, our tests with the with the miners and also with some companies, including the SGS. This has, has proven to recover more than 90% plus of gold that uh, we are able to engage. So it has it's, it runs on electric um, uh, generator, uh, motor, uh, which is a 0.75 kW. So this is, I think you say it, it's friendly because uh, it's robustly built and it helps the miners in terms of having to provide an alternative solution. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so that's the gold catcher in the field. And then uh, basically we engaged the miners in a, sometime last year and also this year. Can we go to the, the next slide? Okay, so basically the, the, the sluice is attached to the gold catcher. So together it, it, it becomes one. The sluice is basically to also help trap the gold that could escape from the, from the concentrator. So that's also, you know, one step uh, in terms of having to make sure that miners are able to get optimum gold. And for us, we believe that gold mining is a process. It's not a one end in itself. So basically, at every step, you make sure that you're able to get that higher recovery that you need. The next slide. The, 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 actually the last but one step is basically the, the concentrates that you know is gotten from the gold catcher is run through the gold conquer or the gold cube, uh, which is referred to. And basically this is to help further reduce the concentrate into, into a smaller size. Then from here, you can do uh, the arrest melting. So it has, it has a, a, a feed rate capacity of 0 0.5 uh, tons per hour. And it's good because this is at the point where the mercury free system comes in from the concentrator to the upgrader. This is where at the point Ghanaian miners use uh, mercury to, to get the gold. But from this, you are able to reduce your concentrate to that small size where you're able to basically see your gold and then to do the direct melting. So this is, um, the, we stressed uh, you know, on this point because this is basically uh, something new to small scale miners here in Ghana. And they are, you know, I would say in a fast pace, accepting that this can uh, uh, replace the, the use of mercury in terms of the efficiency and also sustainability. Next slide, please. So we did a demonstration, for example, for this process and uh, just about a month ago. And this was the gold that was recovered uh, using the, the gold conquer by a small scale miner in the western part of Ghana. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, we come to the last uh, process, which is direct melting. And in Ghana, of course, it's not something new to small scale miners. But uh, the way it's done, sometimes it reduces, I would say, the, uh, uh, the fineness of the gold. And also, so we, we as a company started, you know, uh, introducing some of this uh, gas for gas fueled cattle fairness for them. And then we, we are in the process of introducing a population system to help them, you know, improve their, uh, their uh, direct mountain techniques. So this is what we, we are offering as a company. In Ghana, uh, we, we are making sure Sure that the miners are able to get used to this system. We identified that it's not just about finance, which is a, maybe a challenge for small scale miners. It's also about having to understand the system, right? So it has to do with human behavior. So we are working uh, from the human behaviors so that we can able to push the, the training and education that they need to understand what the mercury free system is. Yes, Ghana is producing a larger chunk of gold, but it's, it's, it's unable to do away with mercury because the system, there's no, uh, I would say, technique as it is now, except what we have introduced into the market. And this is what uh, is changing uh, the, the small scale mining space. So you'll be happy to discuss and then to answer questions that will come from uh, participants. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, so now we've heard uh, four different presentations that focus on using gravity separation uh, for um, mercury-free mining or processing rather. So I would ask um, that the participants, if you can, uh, Marilyn, if you could shop, stop sharing your screen and the participants turn on their cameras so we can see your panelist face um, if you want you don't it isn't required but if you want to turn on your video that would be excellent um, and we've received a lot of questions in the chat and um, or not in the chat very good we've received them in the q a box so thanks all participants for for observing that convention um, so the first question is for orongo um, if we've had several questions for you, Orongo, speaking about uh, your process, the people are interested to know how much um, ore you can process every day using this process. And also, what does the recovery rate look like? 
especially what is the recovery compared to the mercury process that you used to use? So can you um, make any comment on that? You need to unmute yourself if you're able to hear me, if you still have a good connection. We're going to just give Arunko a second because they're, yeah, there you go. You need to unmute. There you go. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, hello. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Please um, go ahead. We do process one ton per day. That is between one to five tons, depending on the work of the day. So uh, in under this, we usually get uh, between one to 15 grams of uh, gold per day, especially when we uh, process one ton or two tons. We can, uh, from one ton, we can get 15 grams, 10 grams. Then uh, the percentage of recovery is uh, between uh, 75 to 95. But uh, depending on how this thing is grounded, how the oil is grounded, so when the oil is grounded into finer powders, uh, we usually recover a higher percentage from the oil. Now uh, the percentage difference between the mercury and uh, this our method is uh, 15 more higher. Well, we usually recover 15% higher than uh, that of mercury. It is uh, also uh, more pure compared to that one of mercury. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those very clear answers. I appreciate that. Um, I The next question um, is for Deshaun. Um, Deshaun, participants are interested if you could comment on uh, the import tax issue. You presented a lot of different equipment. And could you comment on whether the import taxes are a barrier? for miners to acquire the alternative technology? Uh, yes. So miners, depending on the, the scale or bracket that they fall in, would be eligible for duty-free. Um, there are some state agencies that have this duty-free as well, and some ministries. Uh, so we now are kind of working with these agencies to assist miners in getting this duty-free concession, whereby they would reduce the tax on the importation of these mercury-free technology. Um, because we're actually trying to phase out mercury here in Guyana, it would come as a plus for them to actually try to assist in this area. Um, so, as it is right now, miners are, do not have the, the means to battle the importation tax, but we hope that sometime in the near future, they would be able to. Great. Thank you, Deshaun. Now, I know Kevin Telmer um, put a, uh, posed a question about something you raised on, you call them Gemini tables, but I think the more general term is polishing tables. So Kevin, do you want to chime in here and go ahead, unmute yourself and ask Deshaun your question about that? Hi, Deshaun. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, so a polishing table is a table that takes a very small amount of concentrate at the end and upgrades it to something that's directly smeltable. We'll just leave it at that. And uh, that's different than other shaking tables that handle larger amounts of material. So your, your uh, presentation, uh, you said that the, uh, your, your table gets about, an, I think it was 99% recovery. And I, you know, if you could comment on that, because it, in my view, it's a little bit misleading at that stage, of course, you know, you're, you're working on a kilogram of conch and you're getting almost all of the gold out of that conch. So uh, maybe the provocative question is, would mercury do the same thing? And is there a higher risk of losing gold with a table or with mercury? Okay, thank you for your question, Kevin. Okay, so with our setup, we would have already, as you mentioned, 
concentrated the goal to a very a very reduced amount of impurities or, or black sand. Um, we do have a, a parallel circuit, so to speak, running with our circuit, meaning that that parallel circuit is one that is being used with mercury. Um, as it is right now, we still have to conclude on our testing. I know that um, our recovery rate for the, the, as you call it, polished table is, is a bit high, but we're still working with, with the, the metallurgical aspect of it. So I think uh, in a few weeks time, I can give you a better answer than the one I'm giving you right now. But this is the best that we can, we can do right now. Hey, it's great work. I'm not trying to be discouraging at all. Um, no. I think it's great. And, uh, you know, way to go. Thanks so much for, uh, I think, uh, for the answer as well. Happy to talk more in the future. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that question. So the next question is for the, the team um, working it with Solidaridad in Tanzania. So Winifreda, but also she's joined by Cyrus. Um, uh, right, you're still there, Cyrus and John Day. Um, from the impact facility uh, in Kenya, and they work together. And so um, the question is about really the costs of these, the inputs to the process you described, in particular, the cost of energy and gas. So could you, one of you comment um, on that question? Um, what are the sort of the, are there higher um, input costs uh, for that process? So either Cyrus or Winifreda. Yeah, um, for smelting, I, I believe that um, the initial cost could be high because here we are talking of um, purchasing of um, oxyacetylene uh, gas cylinder and um, crucible. This could now make uh, perhaps the initial cost to look like it's high, but when we come to the initial chemicals that will be used, used that would really cut a lot of cost compared to uh, the mercury. So uh, for the for the for the initial setup, it could be high more than double compared to what exactly um, the miners used for mercury, but along the way, the chemical that are normally applied are, uh, could be quite cheap because they are always measured before um, uh, putting them into the crucible for burning. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that answer. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So the Again, I'm sorry, we have very limited time for questions, but I have one more uh, question. And this is for the folks with Commodity Monitor Limited. I think um, that Stephen is joined, I believe, by his colleague, Martha Amoako, um, who's the Director for Operations and Strategy. So one of you, um, if you can take the question about, um, the question from the panel or the participant was about um, how many hours per day can this machine run? And basically kind of what is its um, durability and capacity um, over the long term? So if, you, if either uh, Stephen or Martha want to take that? Okay. Okay. So I take that. Um, with the question, I think our machine works throughout the day. Uh, we expect that it's a machine, so maybe eight hours you get to break a little bit and then you start. So it's a whole day. It's a whole day where people run shifts with it. So, uh, yeah, so it can work for the whole day. Okay, great. And as a follow up, also, oh, sorry, go ahead, yes. Martha, please. Also, I've seen that does it use some other chemicals? Uh, mm -hmm. Pay the question. No, not at all. Not at all. And that's what we don't encourage. And that's why we, we came up with this uh, 
technology and introduce it to Ghanaians also. Uh, we don't want you to use mercury. It's, it's operated by itself. It uses graffiti mechanism system. Uh, once the gold catcher gets the concentrated to a certain level and catch the gold, we expect you to pass it through the upgrader, uh, either the shaking table or the conker by us, uh, and then you go to your smelting. So no chemical needs to be used. You don't need it because the chemical don't give you the percentage at which our machine is giving you. So why don't you use it anyway? So mm -hmm. we don't encourage that at all. Uh, the last uh, government is banning some equipment. Our equipment, uh, I have to encourage the Ghanaian miners that uh, it is accepted by the government. It's uh, registered with the Minerals Commission, which is the National uh, Minerals Regulator. Uh, so it is recognized. In fact, I must put across the states or the government is buying some of these machines as a form of supporting small scale. Uh, miners and also as a means of also trying to formalize the sector, right? So once you have this equipment, be sure it will not be banned. It's well regulated, it is registered, and all documentation in place. And the government is actually promoting it in place. Or I, I don't want the alternative to the use of mercury in the system. Yeah. You Thank you, Martha. Thank you for this. those. Very thorough answers. I really appreciate that. Okay, we are almost out of time for questions during this session uh, because we do have to move on to part two um, of our uh, webinar today. Um, but I, I do want to remind everyone we are collecting all of these questions from both the Q&A and also those who are disobedient and putting things in the chat. Um, and also, please remember you can go to our event page uh, at planetgold.org and look at the event, uh, this technical webinar event. And there's a comment box on the event page itself where you could also place questions uh, for our uh, panelists. And after the event, we will also try to address as many of those questions you know, as, we, as we can. So Marilyn, if you can now tee up the next part, uh, we're now going to move on to the next part of our presentations, um, which is really a commentary on different means of enhancing and improving the, uh, the gravity methods um, and also smelting and cupellation, which you heard um, Stephen mention. So, and also I think uh, Winifreda talked about direct smelting. So first up, we have Daniel Stapper from PACT and we also have Jason Gaber, um, who is from um, Mount Baker Mining and Metals, which is an equipment manufacturer uh, for really specializing in small scale circuits, uh, gravity circuits. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Daniel, who I think is going to be the first to speak. So go ahead, Daniel. Thank you, Susan. Um, and uh, great to be with you all. Um, yeah, as Susan introduced, um, I'll speak uh, on our behalf first, uh, but my co-presenter's name is, is Jason Gaber and he'll present himself in, in a video that he prepared. Um, so, so it's, yeah, great to be with you. Um, I'll be speaking on behalf of PACT. So I work with PACT, an international NGO uh, that's been working on um, small scale gold mining, um, uh, but small scale mining in other sectors uh, more generally for more than, more than 15 years. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna talk about direct smelting and cupellation um, in the presentation, uh, two subjects that have been touched on a little bit already. Uh, but I wanted to just quickly give you a really high level, like what perspective I'm speaking from. So, so as the manager of an international NGO, we've got quite a lot of gold projects right now focusing on West Africa. So that's a region of interest, um, but each country is unique. Um, you know, I've just come back uh, two weeks ago from Mauritania, very different from, from uh, you know, the, the situation in Ghana. But this is just a highlight of some of our projects in West Africa. Uh, next slide, please. And all of those focus, they have a strong you know, focus on mercury abatement. That's what a lot of these projects have a strong focus on. Uh, so I wanted to just give a really quick uh, overview here of the main four steps in the process. This is not uh, new to any of you, but obviously ore extraction is how the process begins. Uh, and then the gold needs to be liberated. So we crush the rock down. Uh, and, and this presentation really is coming from, from a hard rock um, ore perspective, not so much alluvial. Um, so, so then once the, the gold is crushed, or, or sorry, the rock, the ore is crushed and the gold is liberated, um, there's a mineral concentration stage. Uh, in most cases, that's not always the case. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll 
leach directly or add mercury in a whole ore amalgamation. But usually there's a, uh, a mineral concentration stage. And then finally, the, uh, the concentrate, just the mineral concentrate is treated to recover the gold. Um, next slide, please, or advance. And I think, yeah, we'll see. So this is, this is one of the slides I use to sort of work with miners and understanding where we wanna focus our efforts to improve gold recovery. Um, and how we can actually replace mercury use, you know, to the point that Kevin was making earlier about, are we talking about an alternative or really a replacement for mercury? And I think it's important to think about, you know, direct smelting and cupellation as, as really a replacement for mercury. Um, and that's where in the lower part of this slide, we see a direct smelting really as a replacement alternative to, um, to amalgamation or, or to leaching. Um, next slide, please. So, so what I'd like to do uh, is sort of define, go through a really quick definition of direct smelting um, and, and cupellation, uh, and then we're going to watch a video that Jason prepared, um, and he'll be available to, to speak to that uh, or answer any questions uh, in follow-up. Um, the, this slide uh, provides uh, an indication of some of the work that PAC's done, um, including in West Africa, uh, to focus on interventions around mercury-free technology. Um, and so a lot of these types of technology have already been discussed on the call earlier today. Uh, and almost all of these produce a mineral concentrate, right? Whether we're talking about a centrifugal concentrator or just improved sluicing or a shaking table, at the end of the day, the miners have a concentrate which needs to be treated to recover the gold. Um, and so direct smelting um, can be used to do that. Um, and at the, at the lower side of the slide, you see some, some of the, the work that the PACT team did in, in Nigeria um, uh, a little while back, um, inspired by Jason's videos. Next slide, please. Um, so, so direct smelting is a term that we use uh, in case it wasn't clear. Uh, when we talk about melting down the mineral concentrate in order to separate the, the metallic phase, the precious metals. Um, it's really energy intensive, so that's really uh, important to understand. Um, and this is one of the main limitations of the method. Um, because it's so energy intensive, you know, you have to bring all of the mineral concentrate past the melting point of gold for it to be effective, obviously. Um, and these limitations are really important to understand because I know that other groups and, and some NGOs um, have, have tried, you know, sometimes you want to have a demonstration with miners on direct smelting and sometimes it doesn't work excellent. Um, it's really important, I think, to refine these methods based on the concentrate in question before obviously working with miners to demonstrate how and why they work well. One of the big limitations is that the mass of concentrate cannot be too large, right? Uh, around 100 to 500 grams is sort of um, in most small scale gold mining situations, um, the maximum, you know, so, so that means that if you have a sluice box and you're ending up with 10 kgs, 10 kilograms at the end of the day, then you still have to reduce that uh, without losing gold. So that's where the cleanup table or, or other, you know, more careful sluicing can come in or panning to reduce the volume. Um, the mineral concentrate should have a, a gold content of around 2%. And the little table I provided here gives you some indication. You know, if you're talking about 500 grams with 2%, that would be 10 grams of gold inside. Uh, next slide, please. This is quite dense, my few slides. Um, so I, I, I want to move quite quickly through it, but you can also return to this presentation, uh, the materials here after um, they'll, they'll be posted. So cupellation, on the other hand, um, is a different process, also an ancient process. Um, but it's a metallurgical process of refining to, to separate precious metals uh, from, from base metals. Uh, and so this is a really important skill um, that I think uh, we need to advocate and, and explain and demonstrate with, with artisanal miners um, in as its, its many different ways or places that we can. Uh, the method can really be used, it, it's really typically used in assaying, um, but it can be also used to produce a clean gold a doré. And Jason's video is gonna show you this in just, just one minute here. Um, for cupellation to be effective for most small-scale gold mining situations, um, it can be used as a final step in the direct smelting process. Um, um, and, and that's, that's what um, a lot of Jason's videos uh, do as well. Um, and it needs to be used with high-grade concentrates. And so we're talking about concentrates of like 50 to 75% gold uh, minimum. Um, so that's very different from the 2% the minimum for direct smelting. Um, so you can keep that in mind. Um, and with that, uh, well, the last final point here with cupellation, which makes it, what makes it unique is that the cupel, you know, the small bowl that you, you melt uh, the gold in um, is actually porous material. And so by adding a little bit of lead or bismuth, um, which is really important um, when you're doing the cupellation, 
that metal, as it melts and it gets absorbed into the cupel, that's actually what purifies the precious metal which is left behind. So that's how cupellation works uh, in brief. Uh, with that, we can move on to the next slide. And I think we'll have the video now from Jason. Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals. And I was invited by Planet Gold to present at one of their virtual conferences this year. And so I wanna make a video today showing the process of taking raw gold ore, like in this bag behind me, running it through one of our turnkey systems, and then taking the concentrates off our shaker table and using a process called cupellation and also direct smelting to recover the gold using uh, mercury-free and chemical-free methods. So a quick look at the ore here. This is a quartz ore that has some free gold in it, but also it has quite a bit of sulfides that we're gonna have to deal with once we get it concentrated down. So let's start by uh, processing this ore through our one ton per hour turnkey system, and then we'll take a look at the concentrates. The whole process starts here with our primary jaw crusher, and the ore is fed into this vibrating hopper, which vibrates the ore down into the crusher, where it's crushed down to about 10 to 15 millimeters in size. It's discharged onto the conveyor that brings the material, the crushed material, up into this holding bin here, where the material can be evenly fed out the bottom of the bin using this magnetic feeder. Once the material is fed onto the next conveyor belt, it travels up to our secondary crusher, which is a hammer mill. The hammer mill is injected with water on the sides of the case there that you can see. The material is fed down the top, and inside that case are rotating hammers and a screen around the bottom of the hammer mill which holds the quartz ore inside the mill to get hit and crushed by the hammers until it can pass through the screen. This hammer mill produces a grind size of approximately 70% passing 30 mesh and 50% passing 50 mesh. The slurry then travels down the orange chute into the distributor trough on our shaker table. The shaker table does not use any chemicals it is only water and gravity. The gold and the other heavy minerals, such as the sulfides, are caught in the grooves of the shaker table. The sulfides and other heavy minerals come down and report to the number three port as a middling fraction. Anything that's caught in the grooves moves over to the left-hand side of the table onto the cleaning plane where the gold can be separated from the majority of the sulfides and other dense minerals by the action of the table and water. The gold and all the high grade concentrates come down into the number one and number two port. And the quartz and other gang minerals has a very low density. And so it is washed down into the tailings trough of the shaker table by the action of the shaking and the water and all the tailings report into this dewatering screw that augers the material up the trough and into a white holding bag. In this system, the water is completely recirculated, so there is no discharge into the environment. We use a roughly 10,000 liter tank that recirculates the water and the very fine material that goes into the tailings pond from the screw, settles down into the basin, and the clean water is then pumped back onto the shaker table into the hammer mill for reuse. This entire system is run with a three-phase generator, and the whole system takes about 25 kilowatts of power to run at full capacity. We do have other smaller equipment that can be used for operators with smaller budgets or less material to process. These include a 16 by 12 hammer mill run by a Honda gasoline engine, discharging either onto a four by eight shaker table or down a 
Fine Gold Recovery Sluice Box. For more information on our turnkey systems or our modular units or individual pieces of equipment, please visit our website at mbmmllc.com. You can also find many more videos on our YouTube channel. We just finished our run. I've cleaned off the shaker table with a brush. I've brushed down all the concentrates out of the riffles that uh, were left down into the number one and the number two concentrates. We've transferred the number one concentrates to a, a gold pan. And I'm gonna show you first my preferred method for cleaning out these concentrates. So here's our gold we recovered. And now I'm gonna take a small snuffer bottle and I'm just gonna suck out some of it to demonstrate the direct cupelling method, but I'm gonna leave some of the gold in there for the direct smelting method. So for the direct cupelling method, you wanna get the gold as clean as you can. If you get a little bit of the, the sulfides with it, that's okay. But I'm just gonna take a snuffer bottle just like this one, and I'm gonna suck up the fairly clean gold into the snuffer bottle. And if I was gonna do this to completion, I would keep panning it down, sucking up the gold, keep panning it down, sucking up the gold until there was no more free gold. Okay, I'm gonna take the material in our snuffer bottle and I'm gonna uh, drain it, siphon it out through this rag. It's just a, a paper towel, uh, a shop rag. I'm gonna shake the gold down to the tip here. And I don't know if you can see, but the tip of the snuffer bottle is filled with gold. Now I'm just going to wash the gold from the tip of the snuffer bottle down into the little cone that I've made in the paper towel. And you can see there, there's uh, mostly free gold. There's a little bit of uh, darker specks in there. But I'm gonna repeat this process until I have all the gold out of the snuffer bottle. I take the rag out of the little cup here, and I just wring the excess water out of the rag. Now I can take my scissors, cut off the excess rag. Now we have our, our free gold and a little bit of sulfides down here that we can now refine. Today I'm gonna show an alternate method if you don't have access to pre-made cupels. I'm gonna make a cupel. This is simply Portland cement that will refine the gold bead into a precious metal button and remove all the base metals. And I'm just making a little bit of a depression in the top of the cement. And this is where we're gonna place our bismuth and gold pouch. This process can also be done with lead, but because of the harmful effects of lead, I like to go with bismuth. And bismuth is very benign actually to, to human health as well as the environment. And there's our little precious metal bead. And here's our precious metal bead. And it's clean on the bottom, it's nice and shiny. Sometimes if they turn discolored or if they have a little matte finish on them, it means you need to add a little bit more bismuth, but this one turned out pretty good. So there's an example of the direct cupelling method. Now for the rest of this material, we're gonna direct smelt it. And I'm going to dry it out in a little frying pan. I'm not necessarily gonna roast it, I'm just gonna dry it out. All right, so we have 100 grams of our material. So I'm gonna add 50 grams of anhydrous borax or borax to this. If you're using a hydrated borax, you should use about uh, one part or 100 grams. But if you have anhydrous, you can use 50. And for soda ash, I'm gonna add 200. I'll probably add 20 grams of lead oxide. We have all our ingredients mixed together. And this thing down the middle is just a piece of iron or steel. And this is gonna reduce all the base metal sulfides to iron sulfide. And it'll all collect down at the bottom here in a metallic form, and then we'll pour it in our cone mold, then we'll chip the slag off the metal button, and we'll keep all the button away, leaving us our precious metal bead. There it is down at the bottom of our furnace. We're gonna fire it at about 1200 degrees Celsius for about 20 minutes after it all becomes molten. And because we're using so much soda ash, I'm gonna bring it up to temperature slowly so it doesn't boil over in the crucible.
There's our cone mold. It's cooled down a little bit. And so I'll get a hammer. There should be a metal cone, little metal tip right here. So there it is. So we decomposed all of our sulfides because there's no mat on top of the button. So there's our metal button. I'll get it cleaned up a little bit and we'll go put it in our electric cupelling furnace with the real cupel and we'll refine our gold out of it. So I didn't know how big of a bead we were going to get, so I put two cupels in here, one big one and one small one. This thing only weighs probably about 15 grams, so we're going to put it in the small one here. Let's check in our cupel. Oh yeah, there's our little button. We'll get that guy cooled down and uh, take a look at it. So here's our little button. And again, it's got a nice, smooth, shiny surface. It's mostly uh, shiny gold color, so there's very little silver. And it's separated from the cupel very nice and, and cleanly, which means uh, it got most of the base metals out. If you still have a bunch of base metals, it'll have a bunch of junk in the bottom sometimes. But there's our second button from our direct smelting. So thanks everyone for watching. Sorry I couldn't go into more detail. Um, I'm sure you guys have a lot more questions such as uh, roasting or oxides versus sulfides or how much can you smelt and collector metals. There's, there's just lots more to cover. Um, but I didn't have time on today's video to do that. But I have covered a lot of those things on my other YouTube videos on my YouTube channel. And so if you search MBMM LLC on YouTube, you can find a whole bunch more smelting videos and hopefully some answers to your questions. So thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the next video. Fantastic. Uh, thanks. Um, if we could advance, there's two more slides. I just want to speak to them really quickly. I think our time is, is mostly up. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all these details here, but um, you can refer back to these because they'll be posted on the website. So this is just a quick recap of the two different methods. Uh, one of the really important things to, to pull out is, you know, for miners, for this practically to work for them, you know, 2% as a minimum amount of gold, around 1 to 500 grams um, is sort of the maximum that you want to get to. Um, and then for cupelling, you have, need a much richer, around 75% uh, gold based on all of the, the great work that Jason has done. And, and uh, yeah, his collection of videos on YouTube, I highly recommend to go and check it out. So we'll return here later to, to review this, but if I could go to the final slide, just perhaps one of the more important things is the cost analysis. And so breaking down, you know, okay, so what does it actually cost? Um, uh, because you need to convince miners that, uh, you know, th there's this investment to set up uh, and that's, that's not really, really cheap, you know, around 67 US dollars based on the, some test work we did on this in, in Nigeria. Um, and then the operating cost comparison. Um, so it's really critical to do this, you know, um, around, you know, three, $3.65 uh, for the direct smelting. Um, whereas uh, mercury is comes in even cheaper around around two dollars you know and that's based on the five gram uh, batch so anyway it's it's important to, to understand that and, and to, when, when you're considering this for your interventions to have this data to have this analysis done but i'll leave it there uh, and jason is also available to take questions in, in the follow-up so so thanks very much for your time today Right, great. Thanks so much to Jason and to Daniel. We're getting lots of, lots of comments that people think that that was a very cool and well done video and presentation. So thanks a lot for that great information. And yeah, we will come back to the questions. Um, but we need to move on in the interest of time. Um, next, we're going to have Sixto Aguero, who's the mi mineral processing engineer with Artisanal Gold Council and also uh, with the Planet Gold Mongolia and Philippines project. And he's going to speak about the inclusion of vibration mills um, as part of the milling process, which helps to enhance gold recovery. Uh, so Sixto, please go ahead. Thank you, Susan. So hi to everyone. And I hope this presentation to be useful to all of you. <clears throat> um, I am the, the head of the Department of Mineral Processing uh, at the Artisanal Gold Council. And uh, today I'll be speaking on the vibration mills. Next slide, please. Uh. So what you see here, it is uh, actually a vibration mill in the uh, shop in China that is uh, being finished. Uh, you can see there is a hopper, there is a screw conveyor that is feeding the mill. 
On top of the mill in blue color and red, it is the electric motors. Then below is the body of the mill supported by some uh, springs. Uh, some update on this is that uh, this mill is actually in Mongolia and is ready to do the staging phase uh, in the following days. Next slide, please. So what is uh, uh, US, uh, in the US grinding represents uh, 0.5 of the primary energy use. Uh, it also represents 3.8 of the total electricity. It means the electricity consumed by the, all the sectors, 3.8 is used in grinding. 4% uh, is used in the mining industry. It means the cost of energy into the mining industry, just grinding represents 40%. A ball mill usually is 15% uh, energy efficient. It, this is the, the top, 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 uh, basically, uh, of the uh, energy and uh, on a ball mill. And vibration mill is rated 40% energy efficient. So you can see there's an uh, there's, uh, there's important energy efficient compared with the, within the two mills. Next slide, please. So, uh, the, if, uh, the stress forces in rock mechanics, if I give you a rock and I ask you to do some um, crushing, you can use five different techniques. The first technique is a tensile. It's like a digging a knife in a rock. You can do, try do compression with your hand by uh, breaking just by compression. You can do also impaction by hitting the rock against something, some uh, hard surface. You can do sharing. Uh, it is like uh, splitting the, the rock in two, and then you can do attrition. It is the action of two surfaces grinding a, a, an ore. Next slide, please. So what is grinding? Uh, grinding is a powdering or pulverizing process. So there's two main purposes when you do grinding. The first one is to liberate individual minerals trapped in rock crystals. It means for gold processing, it means to liberate, to fully liberate the gold out of the rocks. And number two is to produce fines for mineral fractions by increasing the specific surface. This is uh, mostly applied for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, also for the uh, cement industry by increasing the specific surface. Next slide, please. So grinding methods that you usually find and some grinding methods that we have seen in the previous slides from the different presenters, you can do have a tumbling. A tumbling you find in a ball mill, uh, rod mills, pebble mills, that is a, a tumbling action. Uh, you can do fine shearing mills, that is uh, mostly ISA mills, uh, very efficient, but small capacity. And then you can find vibration. So this is, mostly the most used uh, grinding method that we can find in the, in the market. Next slide, please. So this is a, this is a, a picture of uh, what is a vibration mill. Let me explain this a little bit. So bottom uh, left, you see there is an electric motor. This electric motor transfer the energy to the springs. You can see the springs in yellow. And that energy is transferred to the body of the mill. And um, the body of the mill inside, there is a grinding media. You can see in purple. You can use uh, steel bolts or you can use rods. And uh, you have in red the raw feed. You can do also have a regrind circuit. You can send it back to the to, to milling. And um, you have uh, in the end of the, of the process a screen to separate the grinding media from the uh, from the, the ore. So important here is to notice that the energy, uh, once it's transferred to the springs, it uh, becomes in the natural frequency. That is the terminology of the vibration wheel. It's uh, below natural frequency. So it means that the energy, uh, once the, the, the system is in, in balance, uh, it may, the, the only energy used is to do the grinding. Next slide, please. 
So some technology features of uh, the vibration mills, uh, then you have a more uniform particle shape. You can grind between five and 3000 microns, depending on the hardness of the ore. Uh, it really uh, generates uh, a high degree of impact energy. Uh, you have a uh, low initial cost and maintenance cost. You need a lower foundation. It's a quick to do installation. Requirements are five to 10 uh, longer the media life uh, than other mills. Uh, so it's proving energy savings. Uh, they range from 35 to 50% reductions in kilowatt hour per ton of material process. Uh, then you have also redux, reduced maintenance costs. There are no expensive drive reducers or mill support brains to maintain, and only 60% of the chamber requires liners. Uh, then you have increased flexibility. You can do use wet or dry process, and it's easy to use or train. Uh, some important uh, thing that I would like to point, it is that um, the vibration mills reduce the flattening of the gold particle. Once you do a flattening of the gold particle, it floats very easily on any sluice, any shaking table. So it's very difficult to, to, to capture. So that's why it's very important to have the, the, the particle shape, the shape factor. Next slide, please. So this is a, this is a video on a vibration mill. Let me, uh, let me try to explain this video. Uh, you can play, uh, please, Marilyn. This, uh, yeah, thank you. So this uh, manufacturer is General Kinematics. He's based in the US. Uh, and then what you see is the electric motor uh, transferring the energy to the springs. And then the springs is, uh, starts to uh, transfer the, to the body. The body starts to vibrate below the natural frequency. This is a very, it's like a very intense uh, earthquake inside of the, of the mill. Um, you can see um, in the grinding media, there is a high frequency impaction. Remember the previous slides, uh, that you have high frequency impactions between the grinding media and the ore. This is promoting a circular movement, able to move particles around and across the mill to the end of the, of the system. Um, so uh, grinding, it is uh, made by impact and also is made by attrition energy in the, in the body, in the core of the, the grinding section. So this is uh, basically how a vibration mill works. Yeah, next slide, please. So how do you apply or implement a, a vibration mill into your circuit? So usually you have a jaw crusher uh, and a screen. Then you feed the undersize to the vibration mill. Uh, I call the vibration mill is a game changer because all the benefits that you provide to the system in energy efficiency, but also in, in particle shape and shape factor. You can feed this uh, uh, ore to the sluice or, or table. Then you can get a concentrate. That is a, a, what I call daily cash. And the, the tailings, the meeting the tailings, you can just, uh, move to a leaching process, and then uh, for a, a final tailings uh, disposal. Next slide, please. And uh, some, uh, some numbers. Uh, so power is uh, 14 kilowatts. This is uh, specifically for uh, Mongolia. Power is uh, 14 kilowatts. The fit size is 100% passing five millimeters. The vibration frequency is 980 RPM. Uh, grinding type is dry, uh, but you can do wet also. Uh, lighter material is manganese steel. The machine material is carbon steel, and the cost is uh, around 20,000. So I didn't put capacity in this table, but the lowest that you can get on the size in Mongolia when you are processing a very hard material is between 600 to 800 kilos an hour. So uh, if you will be working 24 hours, uh, you will have uh, more than 10, 15 tons per day, 20 tons per day. Next slide, please. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I will be glad to answer all the questions on the question and answer uh, section in the panelists. Great.
Thank you, Sixto. That was very uh, clear and interesting. Thanks. Um, so next, we're going to have a pre-recorded presentation from Christina Schaefer, who is a partner with Clean Gold, and she's going to talk about the Clean Gold Sluice. Uh, but Christina, I believe, is also online, so she'll be able to answer questions during the Q&A as well. So Marilyn, if you want to go ahead and queue up Christina's presentation. Hi, I'm Christina Schaefer. Thanks for having me today. I'm a partner with Clean Gold, a mercury-free fine gold mining and recovery system. I'm also the director of Art Miners, an NGO offering support to those dependent on mineral resources, enabling us as a nonprofit to get funding to bring Clean Gold to underserved nations. Clean Gold was invented and patented by scientist, chemist, and microscopist David Plath. David was originally working on the development of an artificial reef to improve surfing conditions when his work led to the discovery and development of clean gold. The use of mercury to recover fine gold from the heavy minerals surrounding it is why we're here today. And those heavy minerals are often rich in iron sands called magnetite. This is the clean gold sluice with its specially designed magnetic plate it's easy to use, affordable, portable, non-motorized, and it can be adapted to or completely replace a miner's current sluice box or pan. Our products range in cost from $40 to $200, and the return on investment is less than three weeks. For larger operations, simply add more of the large sluices to an array suitable to handle the amount of ore you wish to process. The types of ore that we have worked successfully with are hard rock, alluvial, and placer ores from one ton per hour operations up to 10 tons per hour. Written instructions are currently provided in English or Spanish, but for groups we recommend direct training of a designated trainer who will work with the group members and liaise with us to provide answers specific to the ores and mining situations the group is encountering. Clean gold does not require much water, and it doesn't require clean water. Water for clean gold systems can be recirculated, and the requirement for water is roughly equal to the volume of ore being run per hour. This puts our system in the realm of small solar-powered pumps, reducing fuel expenditures to near zero. As ore passes across the clean gold sluice, the plate becomes charged with magnetite. And that creates a fluidized bed in what we call a virtual riffle system, which traps fine gold and other high density minerals, while lighter minerals and excess magnetite pass through the sluice. As the miner reduces the surface area of the sluice, more of the magnetite is released, more of the gold is further concentrated until it becomes an easily panable amount. Instead of fighting the black sands, clean gold puts the black sands to work for the miner to capture finer gold particles than mercury can. Mercury cannot cover gold particles finer than 70 microns. Clean gold recovers gold as small as 5 microns or 2500 mesh. The gold yield of 50 to 2500 mesh gold is better than 90% when optimized for the gold present in the ore. Now the gold can be collected with a little suction bottle or depending on the scale and market, a directly smeltable product. And it's not just gold that clean gold recovers. Here's a platinum particle surrounded by gold particles. Because the density of magnetite is about five, clean gold will capture higher density minerals present in the ore. The density of gold is 19. The density of platinum is 21, and the density of mercury is 13.6, which clean gold recovers whenever we run into it. This is a clean gold adaptation to an alluvial system in Suriname, and because they put mercury in the crash box as their primary stage of ore processing, this is what we recovered. Free mercury, gold, and amalgam, which opens up the potential for clean gold to be used for mine remediation, to recover mercury, amalgam, and gold lost in the tailings of mining activities. 
and under a grant from Conservation X Labs, Clean Gold is now preparing a pilot project for mine remediation in the Madre de Dios region of Peru. From miners who contact us directly, Clean Gold is widely utilized, with a few becoming distributors and some in Tanzania and Uganda starting their own in country initiatives to spread HG free mining with Clean Gold. Some miners use Clean Gold on abandoned or played out mining sites to recover gold lost during conventional mining without the added monetary or environmental expense of deforestation. For projects where we have spent a few weeks dropping into an area and demonstrating Clean Gold, the reaction is positive, yet sales rarely occur after we leave. We've also bumped into the local supply chain and discovered that those who profit from gold also profit from mercury. Clean gold is a threat to the supply chain as it eliminates the profit-making link of mercury. But now more than ever, through initiatives like yours and more miners becoming no more networked and connected, we are optimistic to continue in our mission. Thank you, Planet Gold, for allowing us the space to present clean gold to you all today. Thank you, Christina, th and thanks for preparing those remarks. And again, we'll have you live during the Q&A. But I did want to point out just as a marker that what you said at the very end about there are certainly people who are uh, against um, the transition away from mercury because they're definitely profiting from its continued use. And that's something certainly all of us who are interested in uh, promoting mercury-free technology need uh, to keep in mind. But we can talk about that more uh, a little bit if we have time for the panel, so which we will. Um, so the last uh, presentation today is from um, John Richman and Mike Gray who are from Sluice Goose Industries. And their presentation is going to start with a video introducing the gold drop technology. And they'll also show us the use of a, of, of a magnetic sluice um, for further gold processing. So go ahead and please start the video. Howdy, I'm John Richmond, and I'm the inventor of the Sluice Goose Industries gold drop, gold and pay dirt separating processor. Pay dirt is introduced wet into the funnel and is washed into the trap by that water flow being introduced into the funnel which washes the dirt down into the gold drop trap. The vertical flow of the water coming up into the trap supports the dirt, in this case black sand, into the trap, but can't support the gold. So the gold drops out of the black sand and into the jar. The tailings that escape the gold drop are discharged across this magnet sluice, which is lined in magnetite, and then the tailings dump into the tailings bucket. To collect the gold, one increases the flow of the lutriation up into the trap to suspend completely the dirt in the trap. Close the gate valve and then unscrew the jar. Dump out the jar contents into the pan to reveal the gold collected in the process of running through the gold drop. We'll finish the process by removing the magnetite from the magnet sluice Panning it out and seeing what tiny gold was recovered in the magnetite. Now I'll use the spin it off to remove the magnetite from the mineral that was collected inside the magnet sluice. Thank you. 
this is the action of the spin it off. It removes the magnetite by spinning magnets. The magnetite does not have a chance to capture the gold because the spin it off tosses each particle of magnetite end over end and it cannot retain the gold being picked out of the pan using the spin it off device. So there you can see the flower gold that was discharged by the gold drop but captured in the magnet sluice. I believe that's the end. Is that the end of the video, yes, John? Because I know it you edited end. it a little since I last saw it. Great, thanks. Yes. So um, Marilyn, if you can stop sharing so that we can see John and Mike uh, and see their video. Hi, I'm John Richmond. I'm Mike Gray. And we're co-inventors of the uh, Gold Drop. And our company is Sluice Goose Industries. And we developed the uh, Gold Drop for the purpose of recovering gold using the process of elutriation to support the black sand or any kind of ore in the trap, which is basically five grams per cubic centimeter or less, while the gold weighs 19 and is dropped right through the lutriation water flow, vertical flow, and into the jar. And that's how we collect the gold. And basically it doesn't really matter what size the gold particles are because each particle, regardless of size, weighs that 19 grams per cubic centimeter and allows the gold to drop through the elutriation water and into the jar. Have any comments, Mike? Um, not really. It's just uh, the uh, the uh, thing that we noticed right away when we first developed the gold drop was this the time saving, the speed which we could recover gold from uh, concentrates and the uh, percentage of gold recovered. Um, one of our associates down in California, a large mine, mining company, uh, did some testing, a lot of testing at their mine with the gold drop and told us that we were in the high 90 percentile as far as recovery percentage. And that's from a large mine testing the, the unit. Um, we were pretty impressed with it. We uh, have pretty much um, found the same results ourselves in the high 90 percentiles as far as gold recovery. Uh, from the from the concentrates that we put through it. Yeah, we're basically very new to this uh, arena of recovering gold without the use of mercury. We've been working with uh, Toby Pomeroy and Mercury Free Mining, and we have some testing going on uh, uh, soon with uh, ores come from uh, Peruvian gold mine and uh, to actually test our process in uh, alleviating or eliminating the use of mercury to recover the gold. And uh, we've had uh, real good success. I have uh, several videos on YouTube, uh, just search Gold Drop and you'll see them. Uh, just with the uh, purchased pay dirt from goldbay.com. And uh, they add uh, a certain amount of gold to the uh, pay dirt uh, I generally buy it in one ounce uh, concentrations in 15 pounds of uh, rocks and sand and whatnot, and generally recover 100% of the gold that is added to the pater. So, which, like I say, kind of verifies our very high uh, recovery. And uh, we're estimating that we could probably run about a ton of material through the gold drop uh, in an eight hour day. And it is run uh, by a solar panel and a small 12 volt battery. So it's very efficient at uh, the use of energy. And it is a recirculating system. The uh, 
water that enters the <clears throat> tailings bucket in the tailings barrel is then uh, gravity uh, siphoned back to the pump barrel. So it becomes a, an entirely recycling, uh, recirculating water system. So you just continually use the water over and over again. And you just empty the tailings bucket of the tailings. And then uh, that way you're continuously just running all of your um, new product into the tailings bucket. And it holds about uh, 12 quarts of um, uh, tailings, it weighs about maybe 40, 50 pounds, so it becomes very easy to handle. So. Great. All right. Any further? I, I did want to point out, John, I'm not sure everyone caught it, that in your video, the gold drop is really used for the heavier, coarser gold, and then you use the material, the magnetic sluice, to recover the more fine material. I just wanted to make sure that was clear to everyone from the video. So, so the, the gold drop isn't really appropriate for fine gold. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Because actually, oh, okay. each, each particle, if you uh, examine the contents in that pan uh, closely, uh, you'll see tiny particles of gold in there. Not all of the small particles drop out, and that's why the magnet sluice to catch uh, whatever escapes the gold drop. But uh, it does recover fine gold in the jar also. Some, yeah, okay, cool. yeah. great. All right, well, fantastic. Thanks so much. And so uh, I know we're almost out of time, but we do have a few minutes um, to address various questions that have come up um, in the chat and also in the Q&A. And um, going back for a minute, uh, well, actually, since I have John and Mike on the screen, uh, one question that came up was, how does this elutriation system really differ from ones that have been used um, before uh, in the mining process? And is it the size of it or the scale? It's the portability. Like, what is the feature of the gold drop that is, uh, that's your selling point to small scale miners? Well, it is a small device and it is powered by uh, a 12 volt battery uh, powered by the, a solar panel. So it's very efficient as far as energy. It doesn't require, you know, a generator to run it. Uh, and uh, so any kind of uh, situation where you're out in the wherever, where the sun's shining, it can't be utilized. And uh, because the, of the uh, vertical discharge of the dirt through the elucidation process, uh, pretty much um, majority of the gold falls out in the initial process. And then uh, the uh, magnet sluice then captures the tiny gold that does escape. So, which essentially is uh, very close to 100% recovery. And the uh, 90, the high 90% uh, recovery um, is was without the magnetic sluice. That was a, just a recent addition to see if we could get some, some actually picks up the gold dust. Is what that's picking up. So without this, without the magnetic sluice, which is a which is a good uh, good concept, um, uh, without that, we're still getting high nineties as far as percentage of of, of uh, recovery. And uh, the sluice uh, the sluice goose as as far as previous elutriation processes um, actually works. The trouble with the other ones is they didn't work efficiently and they didn't work. Uh, really very completely. And what we've done, what the main, main thing we've done is, is refine that process to the point where we are getting high concentrations at a high rate of, of recovery. Um, what typically a person, if they were just panning, may take uh, several hours to do, we can do it literally in minutes. And uh, black sand is especially impressive with the gold drop. Um, that's what we use in our demonstration. It shows itself because it's so, it's so astounding how we just mix a bunch of gold into black sand and, and get near 100% of that gold back out within, oh, for a uh, uh, half gallon bucket, we can do that in two to three minutes and the gold is recovered and the black sand is back in the uh, tailing bucket. So yeah, the, the big difference is, is that it actually works and it actually works very efficiently and very fast, which hasn't happened in the past as far as the iteration processes go. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, 
again, we're running up against the clock here, although I know that the webinar officially ends in one minute, but we're going to go ahead and keep um, asking just a few more questions a little past the time. So sorry to take people's extra time, but I think there's a lot of interest in questions. Um, I do want to turn back to Jason and Daniel. Uh, we've gotten a, a few questions in the Q&A, and I know that you've answered some already, but I want to highlight it for the rest of the participants. Uh, the question about the use of lead in the uh, cupellation process, that there's a, expressed a lot of concern um, about you know, the toxicity of lead, the vaporization of, of lead when you're using this process. You know, are, are there alternative metals that you could be using uh, that aren't toxic, et cetera? So could you um, comment on that? I know you have already in the, in the answers to some of the questions, but could you comment, comment on that for the benefit of all the participants? Sure, Jason yeah, or Daniel? Susan. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, lead is uh, historically been the metal to use for uh, the cupelling and the smelting process. Um, there has been an alternative that has been used recently, and that is bismuth. Uh, and bismuth is really quite benign, both environmentally and to human health. Um, it's it's a common it's an ingredient in the common um, medicine yeah. Pepto Bismol, so you can you you drink it and actually ingest it. Um, okay. And, you know, during the cupelling process, uh, even if you are using lead, uh, between 98 and 99 percent of the lead is reabsorbed back into the cupel in the process. So very little is um, uh, released into the atmosphere. But I would say that even that little bit is, is harmful. And any time that you can get away from lead, using bismuth as an alternative um, would, would be a benefit. And, and actually, I, I have, uh, there is a way to recover the lead from the cupels or the bismuth from the cupels. I've done this. You essentially just crush them up and re-smelt them down. Um, and it's not uh, an economically viable process to recover the metals, but I have tested that, that 98, 99% recovery in the cupel, and, and it is more or less correct. So a huge percentage of the metal. Uh, is absorbed by the cupel and not released to uh, the atmosphere. Okay, great. Thank you for addressing that. Um, oh, and then one other question just for you, Jason, since I have you is, we had a question about how much time the process takes. Um, you might've mentioned that in the video, but could you re reiterate how long the direct, uh, sorry, the cupellation process takes? Yeah, it, it will vary a little bit depending on the amount of metal you're trying to refine. Uh, but in that video where I, where I cupelled, you know, a couple of grams, um, it took somewhere in the 20 to 30 minute range. And one of the uh, other things that I'll mention is if you have a furnace large enough, uh, you may have seen in the, both the electric furnace and the propane furnace I used, uh, I had a lot of extra room. And so you can actually cupel dozens of samples at a time, uh, which will really cut down on the fuel usage um, and, and the cost overall. So uh, for each sample, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes, but like I say, you can do dozens of samples in that same 20 to 30 minute range. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for responding to that. Um, okay. So then we've also had uh, some chat, um, regarding from, for Sixto, uh, regarding the vibration mill and the question about does the gold, can the gold get stuck in the mill? I guess not only vibration mills, but other uh, mills too. Um, maybe Sixto, can you talk a, a little bit about, again, for the participants benefit of what are some of the methods you're using to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, in the system you're setting up? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, after uh, even it, 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 this applies to almost every mill. So once in a while after extended use, you, can, you may get some deposits in the mill uh, but you can avoid them and you can reduce them by uh, having the proper liner in grinding media. Uh, manganese steel helps a lot. So vibration mill is uh, mostly used with, uh, is, is built with uh, manganese steel. You can do also uh, try to increase the throughput on that. So it, it helps uh, flushing the, the, the material. You can do use wet processing and also um, you have to check what is the liberation size of the material that you're uh, making and what is the final step that you will be applying, implementing in the process. So that is uh, 
some uh, steps that you can take on, on reducing this um, gold attachment to the, to the mill. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for those practical notes on that vibration mill. Okay, great. And uh, a question for Christina, um, really a practical one about the gold sluice, about its cost. You can mention its cost. And I know there's different sizes and different applications, but just maybe you can talk about the range. And then I have a follow-up. So go ahead. Go ahead, Christina. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry. Um, for the cornerstone technology is the prospector sluice. The smallest one is uh, $40 and then larger sluices to handle uh, in a raise for up to 10 tons per hour or just one ton per hour is uh, 200 175. Um, we have, we have um, products sized to fit for every stage of processing, primary to uh, secondary concentration to final recovery. Okay, great. Thanks. That's clear. And I did want to just jump, jump back to what I had mentioned at the end of your presentation. And actually, I'll ask you this question, but then maybe wrap up the session with posing this to everyone on the panel and everyone on the previous panel. What what this question about, you know, there are people who are making a lot of money off of the use of continued use of mercury. And, uh, you know, there are different business arrangements that are really baked in to the use of mercury in small scale mining. Just wondered if you have any reflections on, you know, what, what someone who like you and like, and like clean gold who wants to promote mercury free mining, you know, can, can do about that. And if there's any, any ideas or any comments either from you or any, anyone else on the panel who wants to jump in. Go well, ahead. I'll just Christine. quickly say that it is an ongoing issue um, and that miners are not able to sell their gold unless they're buying the mercury. It is a, a very embedded situation. The um, miners uh, that we know of are not able to sell clean gold to the gold shops. They have to sell it as an amalgam in order to get paid for it. And that's to just briefly, there's a lot of issues involved with the supply chain that are causing, have caused us problems for so many years. And I appreciated Kevin talking about how all the interventions have failed over the years, but um, others can probably speak to it as well. Um, this is Mike. Um, Go ahead. One of the things that we, we uh, we're pretty new to the mercury problem in the world. We, we really just, got onto it in the last few years. And the conclusion we've come up with is that as far as getting rid of the uh, economic incentive for the uh, dealers with, with the mercury is that the marketplace will, I think, I hope, we're praying, will push them out. As, as miners are able to afford, as governments jump in and help uh, these, with these other processes that eliminate mercury, um, that eventually it'll just become an economic reality that that uh you just don't need it and unfortunately it may take some time for that to happen that is a big problem and i think the free marketplace will will solve that eventually partially solve it eventually kevin did you want to jump in on this sure sure i think uh, a broader view of this might be that there's middlemen involved in artisanal gold mining there always will be, or middle people. And in fact, middle operators are needed in any aggregation system. So I would say that this, there certainly are people that sort of profit and use mercury, but uh, you're not gonna, it's not maybe the idea of pushing them out isn't the right idea. It's getting them to switch. But you know, if you were, for example, selling magnetic sluices, well, suddenly someone's coming to sell you gold and they wanna borrow money. and. So I think we need to reevaluate this and not really think of it in black and white terms like there's these criminal elements. The, the gold, artisanal gold mining sector is a, you know, it's an ecosystem of operators and it always will be. So I would, you know, I would just look at this less in less of a criminal way and less of an entrenched way and more as a, uh, as a dynamic ecosystem that does require uh, you know, I call them middlemen, middlemen operators. And I think there's lots of evidence to sort of re-describe who those people are and that we might even want to engage these middle operators um, in our efforts to scale up. Maybe it's a bit provocative, but uh, I think it's a, a worthwhile uh, uh, viewpoint to think this way a little bit. 
Great. Thank you for that intervention. Just one quick, I just one quick comment. That, yes. was my point. that was my point exactly is the free market will get these people that are selling the mercury to start selling equipment that they can make money on too. Um, and that's, that was my point is that yes, the free market will do as it always does. People change, they change their attitudes, they change their, what they're doing. And I think some of these people who, uh, uh, who are selling the mercury will switch over to selling equipment. That, that well, thanks, John. People selling mercury are often not actually making a ton of mercury uh, money on the mercury. It's more about the gold trade that the mercury brings in, just to make sure everyone's clear on that. There's money to be made in mercury by a very few small number of people, but mostly there's that sort of dependency relationship, which could also work for equipment, as you're describing. Yeah. Okay. Any, any last thoughts from anyone before we close the session? Go ahead, Kevin. Cl Why close not? us out. Close yeah. us out. Why not? Uh, well, listen, thanks. It's been awesome. It's been really good. It's been a great session. I think just having everyone communicating together and building the communication network is an excellent outcome. Um, and then there's, there's one comment I might make that will help people to think about things a little bit more. <clears throat> and that's the difference between um, pilot operations versus commercial operations. And when I say commercial operations, I don't mean large, that doesn't mean large at all. Pilot versus commercial is the difference between finding something that works, that's pilot, and then finding something that works operationally. Okay, that's, that's the commercial operation. So if you think about other technological areas, even the large scale mining, but it could be the manufacturer of a toaster, Okay, creating a device that works is kind of step one. And that's where I would describe where a lot of the presentations are at now. Now, next, creating a device that can operate commercially is quite a big challenge still. And that's probably where this whole group, including myself and my group, need to go. And that means taking, for example, if you have 10 different steps and you're very careful and you're capture, you're getting a great recovery, 95% gold. Okay. Excellent. You have technical uh, understanding of, of what's going on. Now you need to see if that can operate on a day-to-day -day basis and actually produce uh, gold regularly. And the operators aren't too uh, confused. It's not too complicated. Um, there's, you know, there's not uh, a huge maintenance cost, et cetera. So, so that's, that's an important next um, you know, sort of framework to think about these things. So it doesn't matter only if it works. It also yeah. has to work in an operational setting. Thank you so much for that plug for the Planet Gold program, where our objective really is to put these mercury-free technologies into operation and to try to document you know, how well they do you know, at a commercial scale actually producing gold day in, day out. Um, so as I think it was Deshaun said, you know, stay tuned, you know, from, you know, all of the Planet Gold teams, um, we hope that we'll be able to pr produce that kind of evidence around the, you know, the practical application um, of these technologies. So I'm going to end it there today's session. But of course, we have part two of our uh, technology fair is tomorrow, same time, nine, nine o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. And uh, today's session was really focused on the tried and true methods many are familiar with, gravity separation, etc. cetera. Uh, tomorrow, we'll still have a little bit of that in terms of trying to take, take some of these technologies on the road and have mobile sessions, uh, sorry, mobile uh, units. Um, and then we're also going to have some very interesting presentations on some emerging technologies, especially focus on new lixiviants um, and alternatives to cyanide um, that, again, you know, still are kind of in the development phase, but I think uh, will be very, very interesting for everyone to hear about. So I hope to see you all uh, again here tomorrow for our part two of our uh, Planet Gold Technology Fair, uh, Mining Without Mercury. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I wonder if we can talk about uh, the uh